Hello, Faithful Politics listeners. This is your faithful host, Josh Bertram, and uh, our politics host, political host, Will, is uh, currently on... Dr- Wait. Oh, hey, Will. What's going on, buddy? Oh, hey. Hey. Good to see you again. Yeah, welcome back, Josh. <laughs> I know. I've been... I've had a hiatus. It hasn't been that long, though. When's the last time we... It's only been a couple episodes, right? I had football. Hmm. Football coach. You can basically call me Coach Lasso. And if you don't get the joke, then you should look up Ted Lasso and watch it. There you go, Apple. That's a free advertisement. Now they can start helping us pay for the stuff on the podcast. By the way, with the Ted Lasso reference, I have to mention that my former wife, my children's mother, her uncle is the creator and producer of Ted Lasso and won a Golden Globe for it. Whoa. Well, yeah. maybe you can get us connected with uh, her uncle. That'd be awesome. Um, and by the way, this is Dale Fickett. <laughs> <laughs> Dale is uh, coming on as a guest on a show. He's a friend of mine and a friend of Will's. He's an entrepreneurship professor at the University of Richmond and the president of RV. A works and the Open Trellis Initiative. Um, it's a uh, RVA Works is a Virginia nonprofit that's leading initiatives in entrepreneurship, innovation, micro enterprise, and startup community development. He's also served on boards of directors with the U.S. Senate Small Business Award Panel, the Virginia Catholic Conference, and the Virginia oh, wow. Social Enterprise and Impact Investing Working Group. He's lectured and conducted research on entrepreneurial finance and developmental economics at Northwestern University, Trinity College, Dublin, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, pre- uh, previously, uh, Dale um, led a startup in the retail sector and served as a strategy consultant with Accenture's European Financial Services Practice which focused on capital markets and transactions banking from the Dublin and London offices. So thank you, Dale, for coming on and being a part of what we're doing and hanging with us today. How are things on your end, Dale? How's the entrepreneur entrepreneurship going? Everything is going really well. You know, I'm, um, I'm kind of in this spot where we have a lot of really good things happening around our organization, the Open Trellis Initiative, is super exciting. Um, also, just really pleased to be joining the faculty at University of Richmond. That's going to start full time in January. So that's cool. It's just a really great season as far as work goes. Um, but you know, I, but probably even before that, I I feel like everyone in my family right now is doing well, and I'm in good health. And everything after that is icing on the cake. Yeah, it's a really good point. I uh, th- that especially in a season like we're in right now in the world, it's so good to be able to hear that. So you mentioned open trellis. Um, what is that? Explain that a little bit because we mentioned that um, and explain that for our listeners and watchers. Yeah, so Open Trellis is a new initiative that we've just recently started. It's all about entrepreneurs coming together to help each other. And that's uh, by providing knowledge and sharing links and, um, you know, saying, hey, I saw this cool video or I saw this cool blog article. You guys should check this out. Or it could be, hey, I have um, some connections that I want to share with someone that's um, starting up a business. And so it's really all about entrepreneurs helping each other. Um, and then we're also, we, we just started a new capital access program with Capital One. So um, we're building out a whole new loan program there as well. So it's all about people helping each other build new businesses. And I would say democratizing business ownership. Mm. So, so with, with entrepreneurship, um, so you're located in Virginia. Um, as are we. And uh, um, is there is there one particular party that's actually better to have an office if you are trying to become an entrepreneur? Um, is there, a di- I'm sorry, Will, um, is there a different party? No, is there a particular party that that's 
more advantageous um, kind of with philosophy, style, principles, what have you. Like that... Republican versus Democrat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, oh, I gotcha. <clears throat> yeah. So I don't um, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that um, people. People are looking for um, the truth. I think people are seeking a lot of um, a lot of ways to identify truth. I think that they're um, naturally attracted to things that are good and beautiful and true. Um, and I don't think that, you know, that's really about a political philosophy necessarily or a political party alignment. I, I, I think that's um, just being a part of the human race. And, um, and, and I think that there's a part of us for a lot, an awful lot of people that is creative, um, which is looking for new opportunities and is looking at new ways to express oneself. And so I don't necessarily see that as a, a party affiliation, I, if that makes sense in a way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, um, I really like what you said, like uh, people, everyone, you know, on both sides of the political divide, people want someone to live the good life. You know, they might define that differently. They might look at uh, the mechanics of how to get there. The details of how to get there might be different. But I think everyone basically, um, you know, basically wants everyone else to have, you know, a good, a, a basically good life, you know, that it's the vision, it's the philosophy of the good life that we, you know, that we uh, um, disagree on so much. You know, we, Dale, you and I have gotten to know each other a little bit over the last few weeks and kind of met, and I would say kind of a divine appointment to a mutual friend. And we got connected um, on a lot of different areas. And one of the things that we talked about that was so interesting to me was the, connection, if you can imagine a Venn diagram, the connection between politics, which we talk about a lot, faith and religion, which we talk about, and then almost this missing element of economics. And I've, I've thought about that quite a bit. I've had economics professors on because it's like, where is economics it's called the dismal science, you know, but it's uh, where, where, where is it fitting in all this? But you've talked to, we've talked a lot about that and the heart that you have, and we'll get into that as we move on to the episode the heart that you have for, for economic development, but how did this become a passion of yours? Like kind of help us understand your story as it relates to the intersection of faith, politics, and economics. Yeah. And thank, where yeah. you come to today. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Josh. It, it's great. Right. Because it, it helps sort of ground all of this in a, in, um, in a really interesting way. Right. So I guess, the, the first part is to know me is to know that I'm a disciple of Christ, uh, that I am really happy about that, um, that um, because I'm called in love and service, that I try to use the blessings that have been, st been bestowed upon me to help people that most need it. And so, you know, if you look at my resume and, and you read out <clears throat> my um, background there, you know, what I'm bringing to the table essentially is in the world of economics, finance and business. And so it just so turns out that those um, those tools have a, a applied to an awful lot of people in, in a very practical, pragmatic way about helping people have a good livelihood. Uh, back in 2007, and I, I can tell you this was definitely a journey, um, but back in 2007, I was living in Dublin, Ireland, and I was um, going through the process of converting to become Catholic. I had reached a point in my life which um, a, a, a lot of the things that I had been trying professionally were just not working. <clears throat> um, I was, um, and I, I was also in a place of um, just a lot of soul searching and really looking at my work and my life and trying to make sense of where I was. And, and so as that was happening, um, one of the things that I did was I, I um, joined the Catholic church. I was 
Um, and I've never regretted that. I've, I've always really enjoyed being um, a part of the church. And, um, and, and at that time, you know, I was doing some homework um, and you know, I, I hope that this kind of comes out in the right way, but I was doing some homework for a class that I had been taking to become a Catholic. And so that process is called the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. And so I was going through that process and I was on the back of a Dublin bus in Ireland and I was going into a project site where I was doing some consulting work. And I had this really powerful spiritual experience. And so um, what that meant for me at a very personal level was, um, you know, I'm sitting there, if you can imagine, I'm reading this book, I'm riding on the bus, I'm going into work. And it was like these waves and waves of energy. And it was difficult for me to catch my breath. It was this incredibly powerful realization that wow. all of the things that I was attributing to myself as my accomplishment, my attainment, you know, my resume uh, were really blessings that were bestowed upon me. There were doors that were open to me through God's grace. And that because of that, um, you know, because of that realization, it, it instantly also resonated with me as deeply true that the purpose of my life was and is to help people who most need it utilizing those tools. And so it took me several hours. I mean, I got off the bus, I went into the office, I had to go into the bathroom to kind of to, to kind of settle down from all that before I could have a coherent conversation with anyone. But it was um, it, it was a really powerful experience that set me on a course of becoming very interested in topics that I knew very little about at that time. Things, like, and you mentioned a few of them, developmental economics, microenterprise development, community development, um, you know, and the, and the terminology can be confusing because it changes depending on if we're in the nonprofit world, if we're talking internationally, if we're talking about public sector policy, if we're talking about um, a corporate initiative, the terminology can can change, but at its core, it's about helping more people become business owners. Wow, that's a that's really awesome. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, Colin Powell just had his funeral um, recently, and his um, son was given a eulogy, and and kind of one of the things that he had mentioned was. Um, about you know the the kind of life that that people choose to live and um he said and i'm sort of paraphrasing here but basically that you know you you can live a life where your eulogy focuses on sort of your life um and your faith or you can live a life where your eulogy focuses on your resume and and i and i remember just, and I, I i heard that and i was just like wow like that's it's pretty powerful, you know, I mean, because it's, it's one of those like it seems cliche that, you know, if you if you find a job you really like, you'll never work a day, you know, again. And and it's just like that's kind of what I'm hearing you say is basically like you you sort of found your purpose um, and you're living out your purpose. You're, you know, uh, making money off your purpose and it probably doesn't really even seem like work to you. Is that is that an accurate characterization of kind of where you are in your in your life and your career? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, what you're saying there will resonates for me. Um, and I talk with a lot of students, whether they're you know people that are younger, that are undergraduate students in their late teens, early twenties, or it could be someone who's you know further along in their career, and uh, you know they're starting a business. And, and either way, people will ask me about the direction that they should take in terms of their career. And I'll tell them that there was this really good book. Um, it, it, it's actually called Good to Great uh, by, um, by Jim Collins. He's a management um, author. And he, and he was talking about businesses developing a vision. And he was talking about that, you know, really – exceptional companies have this vision that meets these three criteria. 
And so, and, and the reason I use this example is because I ask people to use these three criteria in terms of their personal vision for where they're going in their life and what they want to do with their life. And I'll say that, you know, the first thing is to identify things at which you are truly exceptionally good, right? And when I say that, I don't mean like an Olympic swimmer, right? I, I mean, in terms of, of all the different things that I do, here are the things that I know I'm really good at, right? And so it's not in a competitive sense, it's just an awareness of what I as an individual am good at. And so it's kind of taking that and then also looking at things from a practical perspective and saying, which of those things will really drive my economic engine and create opportunities for myself and my family? And it's just a very practical sort of view on that. And then the third thing is passion. And it took me a long time to figure that out. And I just shared with you a big piece of that. But it really took me a long time to figure out what is it that I'm passionate about, right? At a, at at the core of Dale, what's there, right? And and what's dying to be expressed out into the world. And uh, so it took me a while to figure that one out, but uh, but I got there. And uh, and and I think that it it's a really great point, Will, because that's what um, I, I think that people are looking for themselves is to identify those areas where they can express their passion with something that they're really good at and which drives their economics. You know, what's, what's interesting about that is this may, this may come to a surprise to a lot of our listeners or viewers um, is that um, Josh and I don't collect a single penny from doing the podcast. And um, you know, we do the podcast because we just think it's kind of cool and neat. And we both kind of have a heart for talking to interesting people and, you know, and, and it's a bit of a passion for us. I mean, and we put a lot of, sweat equity into making sure that we have great episodes week after week and booking guests and and what have you. And, um, you know, but, but we do it because it's, we're just passionate about it. And, um, that's, that's not to say that you shouldn't click on our buy me a coffee link at the bottom of our website and donate money because every little please, bit helps. Please. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> in, in lieu of you donating any money, like we'll still continue to do this, you know, and, um, because we just think it's, it's, it's important that we just bring this types of conversation, just the dynamics between Josh, myself and our guests sometimes. And, you know, we just, we really enjoy doing it. So I, I, I I, I really appreciate you you saying that. And uh, uh, Josh, I, I think you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think it's, I, I, I love the idea of finding your passion because I would agree with Will that, um, you know, I do this and we, and not only do we give time, but we give over our own personal finances to make sure that this is going and, and, and but we want to do it, right? We want to spend time on doing it. And I think it's important for everyone to find the area of passion that that I, I mean, I think that God's put in them, whatever God they feel like they serve or don't believe in a God. I think there is one true God. I think he's put this passion in everybody. And I think he guides us. It sounds like that's exactly what happened for you, Dale, is that he guided you and gave you this profound spiritual experience. It reminds me of of this passage in the book of Acts, which is one of the books in the New Testament where Paul, this apostle who's going and starting all these churches, is going to all these different places. And then circumstantially, we think that uh, God prevented him from going to several different places. But then he has this dream and this vision um, of this guy begging for help. And, and it drives him to change course and what he's doing and to go to a completely different place than he was even planning on going. And, um, and I think we have those moments in life and we should look for those moments in life that help us to, you know, that, that, that help us to find that purpose. Cause otherwise man, we're going to find a purpose somewhere. We're going to find something that's going to drive us and something that's going to wake us up. Well, we kind of just, we kind of just get a little bit miserable, you know? And I think that people that ha don't have purpose tend to be pretty miserable, at times. And it's not, not that when you have one, you don't go through difficult times. Of course you do. But that lack of purpose is, is, is on, honestly, I think deadly in many ways um, to your soul and even potentially to your life. And, and I think that 
that purpose is so important. How has that sense of purpose, Dale, driven you? How has it kept you going in difficult times? Well, <clears throat> yeah, Josh, I, I just want to respond to your, your comment there. I mean, I, you know, for me, the, the whole point about distraction is a huge one, right? I, I think that in all of us, there are things that we really, really want to do and yet don't, right? We get distracted somehow or another. Um, and then there are other things that we really want to avoid, and yet we find ourselves in these unhealthy patterns, and they just sort of like perpetuate. It's like this kind of like a negative flywheel that just kind of keeps coming back around, right? And um, and and so I'm I'm totally agreeing with you in, in terms of distraction. Um, I, I also think that there's kind of this dynamic going on. And I, I don't know how you guys see this, but I've been thinking about this a lot and, and it feels like a lot of that distraction has to do with, and, and particularly currently, has to do with sort of skimming across the surface of life, right? So it, it's kind of a, a reticence to go deep to become deeply aware of what's going on, to become deeply present to another person, to be intimate with another person. It's almost like skimming along the surface and taking in the, the, the data, the images, the um, audio, just kind of um, almost feeding an addiction for information and entertainment and comfort and convenience without really going deep. And uh, I think that's kind of at the heart of the reticence on delving into one's passion. Um, I, I, I'll, I'm curious about, so your background's in business. Um, and you teach a class on entrepreneurship, and I'm, and I'm, I and and you're also a believer. So I, I'm I'm really curious on kind of like your uh, your take on the church as a business. Like, is is church a business? And you know, like like we 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 did this episode I think last season where we sort of like dissected kind of the role of the nonprofit status of the church. And um, whether or not they should or shouldn't be um, taxed, and obviously, like Josh had one idea because he's a pastor of a church, you know, <laughs> like and and I and I sh I share that passion because I actually work for a nonprofit, <laughs> but but I but I I'm curious just from sort of a business economic standpoint, like what what are what are your thoughts on on that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so. Uh, so a couple of things come to mind, Will. So the first is that the church is, I mean, if we really think of it at, at its essence, is a community of like-minded people coming together to give right praise to God. Um, so there's an element of worship. There's an element of evangelization, which is essentially teaching and preaching, um, and it, it's helping people to understand the faith, and then it's serving people who are on the margins, right? That That's church. Um, now, <clears throat> I think that the question about how does that operate pragmatically is it. it starts getting into the area of human institution. And I think a lot of times we can confuse the, the uh, principles of the faith, um, the essentially the tenets of being a disciple with a human institution and its faults and failings. And <clears throat> um, from, a, from the institutional side, I think there you have an organization that has facilities, that has staff, that has, you know, expenses to be paid that, you know, if we get into that world of the financial piece of it, um, then there's a budget or an endowment or there's fundraising campaigns and there are initiatives 
and so forth. So in my mind, that's how I sort of distinguish between those two. Um, I do think that the tax exempt status for those organizations with charitable and educational purposes is good and appropriate. Um, I know having set up a nonprofit that it's much more difficult to establish a nonprofit than it is a for-profit. Um, and that I think because of the public benefit that humanitarian work provides that the tax exemption is appropriate. Well, so, so if, if, if you don't mind me, just, just kind of, I don't know, playing the devil's advocate for, for a second. Um, so like, what's the argument or here, I'll, I'll back up. So based on my limited understanding of how a organization you know, gets a nonprofit status because I, I haven't set up a nonprofit and I've never pastored a church before. Um, but, but based on my limited knowledge about a nonprofit is, you know, you get your nonprofit status because sort of there's a social element of what it is you're doing. That's kind of helping community or, or, or what have you. So assuming that definition is, is even remotely correct, you know, like what's, What's to keep, say, like Google from becoming a nonprofit? Because, like, at the end, of the, like nonprofits can still make money. Like, like that's sort of a, a misnomer. Um, so, Google, you know, has this, you know, mission of connecting everybody, and you know, I think they even had a motto like "Do no harm" or something like that. There's, there's something sort of written into their business model that, that you know, people can debate about, about whether or not they, they've met their sort of social mission. But, but like, what, what would be the difference between like a Google and like a short pump community church? Sorry to use your church, Josh. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes. So there are, so I'm going to, I'm going to speak specifically about the United States and in other countries that it, it varies. So in the United States, there are several different tax definitions, and I don't want to get kind of too technical about this, but um, but across those different um, types of organizations, as, as the organization is formed, you are essentially telling the Internal Revenue Service, this is the form that we've chosen because we're choosing to undertake these types of activities. And because you're signaling to the IRS. In our case, we, we said we're forming for the purpose of providing charitable and educational services to assist people against that are up against some sort of economic or social barrier, become a business owner. And we therefore should have tax exemption because we're helping people who would not otherwise get it. I think that that um, kind of delineation in terms of the charter is the main thing. So organizations, to my knowledge, don't change that. They, they don't change tax designation if they want to undertake, you know, and, and I think uh, Google, for example, might have a charitable nonprofit. I, I know that they have Google org, um, but, you know, that that's kind of one thing. I think the other part of it is, if you're forming, and another way that I think of this is if you're forming to sell something at a profit, if that's the primary motive, that's fine. Um, that's a for-profit, LLCs, S-Corp, um, et cetera. Uh, and on the other side, you have, no. We're, and in our case, we're a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit, non-stock organization. No one owns stock in our organization. We receive money and we exist not to sell things at a profit. We exist to give things away. That's the primary purpose. Yeah, I would speak to that just for a minute. Like, um, yeah, I mean, you hit on the, the, the key differentiation is selling of a good service versus the giving away of something. Um, which the government would have to do in order to, it, it's something that the government that would fall, if not for a nonprofit under the purview of a government, which in the case of a church would be religious education and care for people in 
you know, care for the people that are in the religion or that are part of the organization. Like a church can't like um, a church can start like things that are that have a profit. But if it but if that profit starts to get to a certain percentage of their annual revenue, um, do you start to have issues and it starts to make it, you know, to make it um, muddy. And that's when you can actually endanger your nonprofit status, because like I can't sell spiritual advice. You know, uh, you know, I can't, I can't pay an admission to come to the church. Have you um, tried selling spiritual advice? I mean, I there might not. be a market there. I'm sure there is a market <laughs> for it, uh, but that's what guys do when they make books. So a lot of pastors uh, make profits and they and they write books, right? But there's and there, of course, like Dale alluded to, there there are several tax issues and and ways that you form the corporation. You have to have a board. The board has to make the decisions. It's not like a sole proprietor where only the one person can make the decisions on the money and stuff like that, the way in which money is spent. Um, you know, you get money through donations, through people giving, as opposed to, you know, selling anything. So, so again, someone gives like a million dollars, you can't, you know, they're not giving that in exchange for something. Like that's illegal, like for them to give. And then you all, you get this, you know, this part of the church that exclusively you can use. Now, maybe people, you know, behind closed doors, you know, make those kinds of agreements, but that's never something that can be written or public or whatever, you know, that it's like, oh yeah, th- this person gets exclusive rights to this because they've given this much. No, that's like something in exchange for a service. Yeah, so that, you can't. Yeah, Josh, that, that's a great point about the fact that you can lose your nonprofit status. I mean, you know, and in our case, for example, we are starting a new loan program that I alluded to. So, um, so we can provide loans which are helpful for the people that we're assisting in terms of building their business, which is all fine and appropriate. And there are examples of nonprofit lenders, but that's not becoming a conventional bank, right? Those are two different things, a nonprofit loan program or specifically um, a, a charitable loan fund is different than a commercial lender. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and of course, that's why they have all those different kinds of things, like it, different kinds of formations under the IR, IRC, IR, Internal Revenue Code, or, and all that and how, and how you work for it. You know, thinking about the, the creating nonprofits that go in and help people and do things that maybe the government would, you know, be doing or, or either would be doing or be good for the common good, like it, it would be good for everybody or for a society in general to have this kind of thing. And the government would have to use tax dollars in order to pay for this. So that's the whole idea behind tax exemption is that the government would have to do something equally, would have to use tax dollars in order to do that. Um, what, what, I, I have this thought, and, and it's going to move into a question, Dale, about what you do. So you go into kind of your target is underprivileged communities to help them start businesses. So you have this, you have this mission that's driving you here to help them start businesses. And we have a lot of government programs that come in and help provide money or, or food or services for people that are underprivileged. However, they define that in terms of like, you know, in terms of their income level. So what do you think, how do those two things work together? Meaning, your mission to help underprivileged uh, communities start businesses that make profits and give them financial independence versus this kind of financial dependence in some way that's given by, or however you'd want to say it, like there, there's a financial assistance, you could say. I mean, it is assistance <clears throat> that could lead to dependence. What? How do those things work together? And then how do they, where's the tension in those things? between what you do and government programs that you see that are funded by tax dollars. Does that question make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. So there, there's, and there's a lot, there's a lot in there, right? Um, so I, I think that the natural starting point for that is the role of government 
and then the role of nonprofits, right? So the role of government um, is about providing for the security and well-being of the populace, right? And we could debate, and a lot of people have debated for a long time about how to do that. And the role of nonprofits is really about providing some sort of public good, as you just said, Josh, which um, which which the government may or may not do, right? I mean, like the SPCA, for example, is a nonprofit, I believe, um, but the government is not undertaking, you know, care of distressed animals, right? So, to my knowledge, right? So, and and we could talk about things in the arts, for example, nonprofits that support the fine arts or performing arts that the government would not be involved with. So, it it certainly as a nonprofit, one certainly has to be uh, providing some sort of public good. So then the, the, the question about um, the economics of all of that can start getting a little bit complex, but I think it's helpful to think of it in terms of, you know, in the, so if we think about the public sector, right, their primary source of funding either comes through uh, the creation of currency through, and now again, I'll just talk about the United States, uh, comes through the creation of currency through the Federal Reserve, through their bond purchasing programs, they push money into the treasury, or it comes through taxation, right? That's the only way that government gets funding and then spends on various programs. And we hear all the debates in terms of how those budgets are allocated. And then on the other side, nonprofits, as you said, are raising money either through corporate sponsorships or through individual donors or through grant programs. Some of sometimes those grant programs come from the public sector. So that's one point of intersection at, at a financial level. Um, OK, so then I think the next question gets into the actual, uh, the actual provision of um, services, right? So if we think about the social services specifically, which I think you referenced, and we think about the social services part of the government's budget, there are certain programs that could be, um, you know, for food, right? Food relief, or it could be um, the in relation to child care or the um, children's tax credit, you know, that th there are certain things in there, um, subsidized housing and so forth, um, which we can look at and we can debate the efficacy of those programs, the extent to which they're helpful or harmful. Um, there's, a, th but this part about business assistance is in the list of the public sector expenditures. Uh, and so then I think the question becomes, well, if they're in the business of helping people start businesses, what are they doing? Right. And so at federal and state level, I would say you have uh, a number of different activities, one of which is mentor programs. There's also workshops that are held in different meetup groups. Um, there's sometimes publicly funded buildings for uh, called incubators that are set up to provide subsidized office support. There's also capital access programs, forgivable loans. So at times there are grant programs for small businesses, other um, concessionary loan programs. When we look at on the private sector side and specifically nonprofits, and we ask, well, okay, so if they're playing a role, what is it that uh, these nonprofits are doing? Um, I think it's helpful to, to sort of um, separate out a few different categories there because there's university systems, sometimes which are publicly funded, but sometimes they specifically private. Um, and then there's also um, uh, the for-profit world of corporates, and investment funds. And then you also have nonprofits that are providing programming. And so we fall in that category. Um, and in that category, you know, I, I can say that under, under the world of nonprofits, 
there's a small group that are focused on economic development. And within that group, there are some which do what we do, which is about helping people build businesses because a lot of economic development is all about workforce. And so what we do has more to do with entrepreneur support. And so, you know, happy to talk about the programs we run, but I, I think, well, I hope laying out that landscape helps a little bit. You know, so by the time this, um, this episode airs, um, the house would have just passed, um, the, infrastructure bill, the $1.2 trillion or, or what have you. So, so we can, we can officially declare that infrastructure week is over, um, which is, which is good, I guess. <laughs> but, um, without getting too, too deep into some of the, some of the, the back, back room politics that, that allowed for that to happen. One of the things that, um, came out of that was basically the, um, the progressive caucus, you know, made a drug deal with the moderates that said, hey, you know, like, we're going to go ahead and sign off on this. But, you know, we need to get your firm commitment that when we, you know, produce this, um, like this social infrastructure um, bill of like another one point some trillion dollars that that they're going to sign off on it. So so the the social infrastructure you know, package has a whole lot of different just stuff in it. Some stuff I support and some stuff I'm like, eh, you know, not really my thing, but you know, if it'll help somebody else, why not? But, um, my, so my question is, is, you know, does having sort of federally, um, provided social programs, you know, better equip people to, um, you know, take control of their lives. And if they choose to become entrepreneurs, you know, does it sort of like help flourish that? Um, or, or do you see it as more of a personal hindrance? Um, you know, as something that it, it's not necessarily necessarily going to encourage people to, to work harder. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> um, so, so I think that there are some trade-offs here and that's the difficult part of, and I'll, I'll call it social services. I know you, you use the term social infrastructure. I, I, I tend to think of infrastructure as roads and bridges and broadband and kind of like hard physical assets. But I can say that um, there are two ways that we can grow the economy, right? So one way is that we, as a population, are able to provide more value per hour, per day, per quarter um, because of the input of what we're doing with our time and effort. And then the other way is to just have more people, right? And so when, um, so, so if the goal is to have a productive population that's contributing to society, which I think is a good goal, that from that perspective, we need to really think about um, how is it that we can provide on ramps into the economy, right? And, and I don't hear it described exactly that way, but to me, that's how I think of it in terms of, you know, when we look across a population, um, regardless of income level, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender identification, what have you, you know, what can we do to have stronger, more robust on ramps into the productive economy? Now, I know that there's a lot of really good work done around workforce development. We just don't do that. We don't do job retraining, reskilling, and job transition. We do the new business formation. And I would say just quickly that with the social support services, um, I think that there's a level of income below which they're absolutely necessary to stabilize a family or to stabilize a situation. I think that we need to really think about the ways in which they can be tapered off, that there are structural incentives for being involved in the economy. And I think that if, if we really get to the heart of inequality, there's a, there's a piece of that that's not only about income. There's a piece of that that's about asset 
inequality. And that ownership piece is what we're, we're looking to address little by little. Yeah, that makes, <clears throat> that makes sense. I, as you're speaking, I, I was thinking about this question. So I would hear different presidents, um, throughout my, you know, throughout my life, um, give different, you know, every president is like, we care about families, we care about workers, we care about education, we want people to thrive. Okay, but we have different visions of what that might be. So if we're saying um, the idea of a level playing field, maybe another idea is um, equal, equal opportunity, right? That's an, an equal opportunity employer. Um, uh, legally um, obliged to be equal opportunity. Um, if you're thinking about leveling the playing field, um, what does that, like, how do you think that works itself out in policies that you've seen on your, in, in your experience? Is it possible to level the playing field? How does that, how does that, and, and, and what is the government's role in doing that and leveling the playing field? Yeah, so, um, so, so I would say that um, the, so the purpose of the economy at, at a fundamental level is about the creation of value and it's about, um, a distribution system by which that value is attributed across the population, right? And if we think about that, um, there's this kind of question about, well, what type of economy should we have? Or what type of economy do we want to have? And I think that there's sort of this push and pull, and we see this play out in the, in, in the politics here, where I think that there's, a, there's one perspective which is all about the free market, right? That is pretty much, well, look, the economy is a competitive landscape filled by private enterprises, which are competing with each other for customers, and that investors need to return, need to receive um, a risk adjusted return on their investment, all of which is good. And um, in, in large part, it's good. Now that can go too far. And that's why we need regulation in place because we do know from historical perspective that when companies become too powerful or even smaller companies that are malevolent, there can be um, harmful repercussions on the population. And we could go through a long list of those. On the other side, I think we have, you know, the role of conscious of, of conscientiousness and competence, right? So what we what what we really want to make sure that we provide is a system by which those good behaviors are incentivized and rewarded and where when people are coming to work, they're coming to own a business, they're coming to give themselves through their labor and through their um, mental capacity, their intellect, that they're um, competent and conscientious in terms of providing that for society, right? So, and we want to incentivize that good behavior. And I think what we see play out in policy is sort of a push and pull between how do we provide the right like base level of support for someone to even start to be productive and yet still have the system in place which incentivizes people to engage and to give of themselves i i have i have a question and i'll and i'll ask it somewhat um carefully because i i understand that as a professor you probably don't want necessarily all your mess out there with regards to your political views about stuff, because like I would want that. Um, and so, so what I will ask you, um, it, it's a Trump related question. Um, and I, and, and I'm, and I'm only asking because I don't know, like were, were, were the Trump tax cuts a good thing? Oh yeah. 
So that's a, yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So generally speaking, I was in favor of tax cuts to spur economic growth, to reduce unemployment and to increase, um, y- you know, the, the, the growth of the economy. I, I thought generally speaking, they were a good thing. Um, but it's like with most, um, most things that the devil's in the details, right? And, and, you know, I, I, I think that in our hyper politicized world, we have this, um, this kind of, you know, like the Republican view and the Democrat view. And, and, and I found that it's very difficult for people who are in, you know, an independent, I myself am an independent, but it, it's difficult for people to sort of parse out those details to understand. I mean, and, and there are certain realities that are not really um, promoted or not really talked about because they don't serve either party's agenda. Um, and so, you know, one of the one example of that is immigration, right? Immigration is incredibly valuable for economic growth. Um, now that's not to say, well, we need to allow everyone to come into the country, but it's a factor in terms of economic growth and therefore really should be a part of the discussion about what's happening on the border. Um, similarly with the tax cuts, I mean, I think that you can easily see the benefit of those tax cuts. Um, and at the same time, um, I'm also in favor of the global corporate tax that was agreed. Janet Yellen came out last week talking about that. I'm in favor of that because it helps it helps us prevent the avoidance of tax that really should be paid for the public good. Um, so I know that that was kind of a roundabout answer, but um, you know, there's been a lot of work done in terms of strong economies and. I'm a big believer in, I think education is incredibly important. I think ownership is incredibly important. Um, I think that as a country, we have a huge amount to leverage internationally because of our culture and competencies around innovation and technology. And I think our example of the, um, you know, of the American dream of ownership is still incredibly important, and I don't think that we should let that die. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you. You know, I'm thinking about Biden and in his economic plans to build back better. What what are your general thoughts on if you have them on his economic policies right now, and do you think? <clears throat> Are we just are we just facing the the consequences of the pandemic, the consequences of Trump era decisions? How much do you think that like the inflation, things like that, how much do you think there are Biden policies or by quote unquote Biden policies that are affecting us right now? Um, yeah, so there's two sides to the policy background that's affecting the economy right now. So one is on monetary policy, which the president doesn't have direct control over. And so we just saw this past week that the Federal Reserve had, um, a, that they made a decision to start tapering their bond purchase programs, which I'm fully in favor of. I think um, it's, it's overdue in my estimation. Um, when we look at the mechanisms by which the Federal Reserve can change the contours of the economy. That's one area is about bond purchasing. Um, there's been a huge amount of capital trillions um, that has been pushed into the economy and which has resulted in the inflation that we're seeing. Um, that goes back as a part of the Trump administration. That's also a part of the Biden administration. Uh, not directly, but in an indirect level, it, it has happened from the Federal Reserve on their watch. The other piece of this um, has to do with interest rates. 
I think the low interest rate environment has been very helpful for home purchases and for people securing mortgages, particularly those who were able to lock in for a fixed rate mortgage over an extended period of time. Um, then I would also say on the fiscal side, which is much more in the control of the president, um, I would say that during the Trump administration, I was generally in favor of those measures that he took um, in response to the pandemic. I thought that that was the right thing to do in terms of pandemic relief when it was needed. Um, in the Biden administration, I think the, the, the area where I've seen the most concern is a reticence to pull back on some of the government spending that is a part of the structural inflation that we're seeing. And the risky thing, and I, I don't think that this is a political statement necessarily, but I think that the, that the risky thing about inflation is that it, you know, let's say for people like me who are earning now and, you know, I'm in my 40s, I'll, I'll be earning in the workforce for hopefully for a while now, um, that that won't affect me nearly as much as those who are retiring now because what happens is it erodes the value of the savings. So, you know, if someone has saved, let's say $30,000 or $100,000 for their retirement or more, um, inflation starts eroding that because they only have a fixed amount of money in a low interest rate environment. It's not going to increase that much. Um, so I think that, that dynamic with inflation can be very harmful, particularly for older people uh, fixed income uh, people. And, you know, I, I think that some of the um, some of the spending ideas at this point, I think, uh, you know, could end up being a drag on the economy. And, and I think, you know, we're in a precarious position with respect to the stock market, because when you look at share prices on a price earnings basis and we're we're in overvalued bubble area in, in an overvalued area and have been for quite a while. I mean, I'm, I'm personally expecting probably about a 20% reduction in terms of where the stock market is today. Mm. Well, wow, that's a, some pretty sobering um, numbers and insight. And um, I'm glad at least somebody like somebody smart, like you understands it because like there's a comedian that says, you know, um, the Dow Jones, um, like lost 300 points today he's like and i can't i can't begin to explain how upset i am that i have no idea what that means <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm, I'm glad people like yourself understand it but um I, I i wanted to ask kind of as our as our last question just um a little bit about um open trellis and kind of like what it is you guys do i know josh mentioned um about a little bit at the opening but um you know a little about what open trellis is what what services you provide, how people can get um, connected into you. And uh, yeah, so uh, tell yeah. us a little bit more. Yeah, th yeah, thanks for that, Will. So, um, you know, we provide a lot of support for people who are starting businesses, right? So people are coming to us saying, hey, you know what? I have this question, Dale. I'm not exactly sure how to get this business up and running. And that could be a marketing question, a finance question, could be a formation question, some of the things we touched on today. So there's lots of different questions that folks have. And so we provide programming. We have an accelerator program that we provide. There's another program that we're a part of called One Million Cups, which is a great national program. We have people come in and speak weekly on their particular business that they're starting, which is great because it's all entrepreneurs coming together to really help each other. Um, I, I think is kind of like community development or community organizing meets innovation, right? It's like the intersection of those two things, which is super cool. Um, and then, as I said, we're providing uh, a new uh, capital access program. So we're starting with credit counseling and opportunities for people to apply for products, which help them build up credit from the ground up, which is awesome. Um, and then soon we'll be initiating some small business uh, loans, uh, a loan program, which will help complement all of that. So it's really about some content and some connections and capital 
all for people who are trying to start a business. No, yeah, that's really good. And we'll we'll make sure that we put links um, in our show notes for anybody that's that's interested in um, connecting with your program. So, um, well, thanks thanks again, Dale, for uh, spending some time with us. Uh, we uh, we hope to have you back and hopefully school us a little bit more about how business works um, and uh, the stock market and build back better. And, and maybe even like when we when the social infrastructure bill comes across the table, you know, somebody can come on board and help dissect it for us. Um, if you get that Sounds kind of time. Good. Thanks for having yes. me. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks listeners. We will see you guys all next week. Yep. Take care. Bye.